Hello, everyone. Tonight we're talking about how to get started trading IPOs. I'm also going to talk uh, quite a bit about how they're the promise of the future. And even if that promise does not materialize, it makes some wonderful trading opportunities. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm, I'm humbled by uh, your being here. So thank you so much. Uh, let's just get the obligatory disclaimer screen out of the way. You can read this uh, if you're having trouble sleeping at nights on my website. Uh, the, it's much easier for me to just sum it up, though. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. If you've been trading for more than a day, you probably know that you can lose money trading. Uh, I always try to start my presentations with the charts. It's kind of a long-winded story, but the short of it is I was in a foreign country, uh, and foreign to me at least, and um, I was late for a presentation, and the guy in the car asked me if I was ready for my presentation. I said, I, I just don't know if I'm going to have um, time to get to the charts, and he said, why not start with the charts? Um, he was British, as you can tell, actually born in India, but lived in Britain his whole life. Uh, anyway, and, and that made a lot of sense to me. And I, the charts are the most important part, so let's start with the charts. Now, a little bit of a little bit of basis, a little bit of a, what am I trying to say? A little bit of background before we do jump into the charts. First of all, what is an IPO? I guess we need to define that before we get started. And I define an IPO as mostly stocks that have come public within the last 100 trading days or so. So it's a little bit more than three months or so. Uh, in general, I guess five months if you're just counting trading days. In general, the sooner the better when you're trading them because there's a lot, a lot of euphoria and a lot of excitement as we're going to see in these issues when you're just getting started. But even after they've been public for a year or two, and these are stocks that are called toddlers because they're still fairly new to the market, there's still some excitement there. I don't want to get too far into that tonight. I did do a uh, another video that's out on YouTube uh, on IPOs. If you go to my channel, you could um, check it out because I did talk a little bit about toddlers more than we're going to do tonight there. But uh, there's still some excitement. Sometimes these new issues come public at a really bad time. For instance, um, recently we had energies implode and some of these energy IPOs just absolutely failed miserably. But if energies begin to bottom out and all begins to take out off a little bit, these IPOs could still be worthwhile. They were good companies to begin with. Their timing was just um, really bad. Okay. So the question is, or the statement is, uh, there's a bull market in IPOs. And the question is, or are you missing it? So it's keeping with the tradition of starting with the charts. I want to show you a few uh, recent um, examples and some IPOs that have just absolutely taken off. And as you can see, these stocks came public. And for the most part, they just rallied up. Uh, nicely now there's a couple of uh few of these in here that uh, we uh, showed in the last ipo webinar and they've taken off nicely too and I'll, we'll get to those in just one second one pattern that i want to talk about tonight and this is probably the the best pattern to get started with this is the easiest pattern to trade when you're just getting started with ipos and that is to wait for what i call a secondary signal this signal back here is a pioneer signal. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time tonight on the pioneer signals, but uh, they can be very powerful. And as you can see, they can get you in these IPOs really, really early. A somewhat safer signal, but not nearly as lucrative, and that's the trade-off here, is waiting for that first pullback. And you could look, if you're familiar with persistent pullbacks. If not, I can give you the pattern off my website. You could see that this IPO had a really nice persistent move higher. And then you're looking to trade the first pullback. Very simple pattern in these IPOs. Here's another one I just took off not too um, – fairly recently, I should say. And yet another one. Now, here's some that I mentioned before um, uh, when I did my last webinar here back in April. And you can see this is a pioneer pattern. This is a, what I call a first breakout pattern. First breakouts can be really good patterns to trade, especially when they base like this. And, again, sometimes their timing isn't just perfect. And they come public, and there's not a whole lot of excitement to them. Then eventually they catch on. That first breakout could be a wonderful trade. And not that you want to just get into a trade because you know where you'd be wrong and know where you could put a stop. But uh, the great thing when you're trading something like a first breakout is, or any of these other pioneer patterns, such as this one back here, the, what I call the buy at B, you can put in a stop right below the low of the range. And if it goes on to make new lows, then you know you are wrong. And we're going to get into that in just a few seconds. Uh, here's another generic breakout and one fairly recently, or at least since the last 
webinar that we did. And here's yet another one that uh, was in the list from the last webinar once again. Now this one's kind of interesting because it did several things. It did, first you had the buy it B pattern, which we're not gonna have enough time to get into tonight, but it did also set up as the first pullback, which this could be your bread and butter pattern if you're trading this. Now it did have a fairly sharp retracement and this is another thing, a pattern that I've identified, what I call the first deep retracement before it actually took off in here. So far, so good from that takeoff. Now, if that did get you too excited, then I'm not sure you should be trading because I've just fired up on these IPOs. And last summer, or actually uh, not last summer, like two years ago, when I started kind of kicking around the idea of doing a, an IPO webinar or seminar, I should say, I got to thinking, it's like, well, what if this bull market ends? And what, what I got to thinking about was, so what? This knowledge can be used in the future. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, okay? And the second best time is today. So learn these patterns. Learn to look for these certain opportunities in IPOs. And if the IPO bull market dries up tomorrow, which I don't know, things are getting a little iffy in the overall market, then you're going to have this knowledge in the future when IPOs come out in the future, because obviously new companies will still come public, especially as fast as technology is moving today. Things are amazing. I mean, you could 3D printers, for instance, they, just, they could print cars now. It's just absolutely amazing. You know, what will they come up with next? And that's the great thing about IPOs. So let's look at a few more in here. Let me show you how great this bull market is. Well, wait a minute, that doesn't look too good. Well, that's, that's not so good. Well, hang on, wait a minute. Do I have my slides mixed up? No, I don't. The thing I want to show you is the great thing about IPOs, especially when the market starts getting a little iffy like it is now, is they either work or they don't. So the bad news is they won't all go up. The good news is that many will have one simple pattern, which I'll show you tonight, that will keep you out of trouble. And it reminds me of the old... Will Rogers saying, and Will was right. Will said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, that's he's being a little facetious, but when it comes to IPOs, that is very much true. And you could keep yourself out of a lot of trouble, stay out of a lot of trouble just by focusing on the ones that are headed higher and completely ignore the ones that are headed lower. Now, I know some of you, your eyes are going to glaze over when, if I tell the story one more time because I've told it so many times, but it's such a great story. Years ago, they, there was a bubble in sardines, tens of sardines, and people were buying and selling them, and they just kept getting higher and higher and higher, kind of like the tulip bubble and all these other bubbles throughout history. Well, allegedly, one person who paid a ridiculous amount of money for a little tin of sardines says, you know what, instead of selling this for this great price – that somebody might be willing to pay me for it. I'm just going to open it up and eat it. So he opens them up and he comes to find out the sardines are rotten. So he tracks down the guy he bought them from and the guy's like, you silly fool, those sardines are for trading and not eating. So when the time comes, you have to be willing to say so long and thanks for all the fish. That's a Douglas Adams quote. And when I say that, I mean, be willing to take some profits, be willing to trade a stop. And if you get stopped out for a good profit, then just say thank you and move on. So let me show you something real quick when it comes to these IPOs. One thing that you will observe and I have observed is usually within the first week of trading, a significant high or low is set. So if you go back and look at all those ones I just showed you, if memory serves, most of those set the high within the first week of trading. And by simply not trade by simply not trading them, easy for me to say, until they at least make a new one week high, you're gonna stay out of a lot of trouble. So it's just five bars. One, two, three, four, five. Wait for at least five bars, and then if they begin to take out that range, begin to think about buying them. And if they don't, if they begin to drop below that range, then avoid them like the plague. Now, it's a little bit more complex than just simply buying them right above the range. But if all you did that, you would do fairly well, and you would certainly avoid a lot of losing trades. I'm a big fan of symbolism, and I like to keep some – symbolism around in my office. I have a currency. If you watch the uh, the timing research shows that I do, you'll see that 
I've got a currency collection on the wall behind me. I like, uh, I like being around money, you know, kind of makes you feel good. And on my other wall, one of my other walls, I have a sardine drive sign. And that reminds me that I'm here to trade, okay? I'm not here to fall in love with my stocks. I'm not here to fall in love with the companies, even though they might be doing great things and growing, going great places. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't stick with the company for weeks, months, and even years. We've got a few positions that are still on in the core trading service model portfolio that we put on way back last fall. So I'll stick with them as long as they move in my favor. But when the time comes, as I often preach, when it comes to money management and position management, you have to be willing to get out at break even. Now, here's the, the beauty of an IPO. There really are a technician's dream. This is the number one reason you should consider trading IPOs. Okay. If you are, when it comes to technical analysis, you're agreeing on price. Everybody agrees on price when it comes to technical analysis. In fact, when it comes to fundamental analysis, when you go to make your trade, at that particular moment, everyone agrees on price. So no matter what your methodology is, fundamental or technical, at the moment you buy the stock, you are all agreeing on price. A technical analysis in its purest form, and the way I use it mostly, is based exclusively on price. Now, we'll use an occasional indicator such as the moving average, but for the most part, I'm just mostly focused on the priced action. Now, if you believe in technical analysis, then you know that if a market goes from A to B, I'm sorry, A to C, and there's B in between, it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C. So if a stock's at 5 and it's on its way to 20, it's going to have to pass through 10 along the way. That's a concrete law. There are no concrete laws when it comes to fundamental analysis. Now, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent on fundamental analysis, but the point is there's no concrete laws. You can't buy a stock that has a certain PE or a certain growth rate or whatever the case may be. OK, but if a stock is going from five to 20, it's going to have to pass through 10 along the way. Now, there's several big picture patterns that I have identified. I think there's about six of them total. The most common one is what I call the fly and the die. These IPOs take off and then they die out. It looks kind of like that, kind of like an upside down V. So here's a couple examples of that as you see these IPOs took off nicely but then they came all the way back in so money management is crucial when you're trading these IPOs and again you have to be willing to take profits along the way the great thing is you could make a lot of money when they head higher I mean this might be 40 or 50 percent move here before this stock begins to come right back in so not all of them will do that but it's probably one of the most common patterns. And it's a very tradable pattern. You can make a lot of money over a short period of time and then it gets stopped out. Every now and then you'll get into a pattern with like, which I call a, uh, what I call the fly and fly, meaning that they just go up and up and up and up and up. And that's gonna just make your entire year. And that's a wonderful thing. But in the meantime, you're gonna have a lot of them take off and then come right back in. And what sort of happens there, not that you wanna, think about it too much okay you don't want to think about the behind the scenes too much but there is some some of the basics that i want to bring out here and what happens is when an ipo comes public there's some enthusiasm and i want to stop short of saying manipulation but there's probably some manipulation going on to push it higher which could be a good thing so that price will begin to take off in many cases if everyone back here did their job properly and i call that before public offering let's call that bpo so you will have some enthusiasm, that enthusiasm will begin to wane, and then price may begin to wane. And it, there could be a little lag afterwards because sometimes you get this pent-up demand and the price continues to go higher, but then this enthusiasm begins to wane, wane and then reality, and I say this is a bad reality because sometimes some good realities can set in with these IPOs, but the bad reality begins to set in in this particular case and then that's how you get the die pattern so there's a lot of excitement early on a lot of and I guess I'll just come flat out and say it, a lot of manipulation early on but then there's people as you'll soon see that are looking to get off the hook and that could be part of the reason why you have this 
pattern that's so common where they take off and then come right back in. Remember, a lot of times they just die out from the beginning. So you just totally avoid those. You could miss a lot of losing trades just by doing that. Now, this is the most common, what I call tradable patterns. You could get uh, pioneer patterns, such as the ones we showed early on. I showed early on, I should say. And you could get those first pullback type of patterns, which I call the secondary patterns. The wild enthusiasm phase could make for some fantastic trades. And trade's a key word in that sentence. So these truly are what I call sardines. Money management, money management, money management is always crucial, especially when you're trading IPOs. And then you still allows yourself to position for longer term trends. So you get that little pop right out and then you just hang on. And sometimes they'll run up 100 percent and then you could stop that. You might make 60, 70 percent of the trade. Well, it's better than a poke in the eye. OK, but by be willing to give up some of that open profits through that trailing stop, like I talk about often on my YouTube channel uh, through the weekend charts, sometimes you position yourself to ride out that longer term trend. But again, sometimes that fly part could be 100%, maybe even 200% before you get that major, major correction. And sometimes it might correct back 100%. So again, you have to have that money management plan in place. Let's say you're getting in here somewhere, you have that stop trailed higher, you take some profits along the way, and then you get stopped out and you say, well, so long and thanks for all the fish. Now, Here's the ground rules, or I should say some of the ground rules when it comes to trading IPOs. Obviously, there's a few more things that uh, there's a lot more that we can cover just here in, in about an hour or so. But always remember, as I said earlier, wait about a week before they come out. I'm sorry, wait for them to be out for at least a week. And always remember that the market is the final arbiter. So don't try to get issues before they come public. Now, if you're lucky enough to get issues before they come public, guess what? You're going to wish you didn't have them. And then you might think, well, I know someone that got whatever the issue may be, the hot issue of the day. But they'll tell you flat out that they have to take a lot of garbage. And also, if you are getting issues, your hands could be tied a little bit. If you're getting, getting them BPO before they come public, meaning that they don't want to see you flip them right out. So now... A lot of times you'll get left holding the bag, but trust me, don't. The grass is always green on the other side. In this particular case, it is not. Do not try to come out here and buy those public offers before they come public. Like public again, the market is the final arbiter when it comes to trading these guys. So wait one week at the least. Anything less than a week, I think, is uh, just speculative. Um, not speculative, but uh, gambling. Okay, speculative at best. Now, the holding time, how long should you hold the IPO once you get in it? Well, as long as possible. And remember, though, it is a sardine, or it might be a sardine, turn into a sardine. So at least until they begin to smell. And then your stop is hit on a reality check. A lot of times, again, you will have a deep retrace. And you never know if this deep retrace is just going to be that deep retrace or if it's going to take and take off again or if it's going to keep on going. So you have to have that trailing stop in there. Let that take you out and then reevaluate with, whether you want to get back in or not. Those of you who are on a trading service occasionally will go after an IPO. We'll make a little money. We'll get stopped out and then we'll go after it again if it sets up again and if it looks good. Again, you have to be willing to to trade and get out of the way when things turn a little sour on you but then you have to have the proper mindset mindset to go back in when things improve and if they don't improve if they don't go back up then don't buy them and i sort of uh have bent but not completely abandoned my core methodology and so there's a little venturing outside of the core methodology i'm not a big breakout player at all. In fact, I, I trade almost exclusively pullbacks for those of you who know me, for those of you who are on a core trading service. But I will occasionally with these IPOs trade something that's a little closer to a breakout, like some of the patterns I'm going to show you tonight, or I've already shown you, I should say. Uh, for those who can't stick around, the uh, special offer tonight, if you use the promo code IPO200, and go to my website, trade IPOs, or go to products and click on the IPO course. Uh, this offer is good until Monday, and I'm, I forget what date that is, but it's good for uh, until uh, good for six days. Okay, 
and you'll get uh, $200 off the course. Uh, I'm going to mention this again in a minute, but I will be doing a follow-up course on IPOs. It's going to be a lot of the same material. I'm basically going to update the charts, show some of the new patterns, and show some of the um, things that I've discovered since I first did the course. Anyone who buys the course gets free access to the live course when I do it. And also, I'm going to have some follow-up sessions, and I haven't determined how many I'll have. Probably about four follow-up sessions uh, every so many weeks. And the great thing about those follow-up sessions is you get to see the methodology in action, and you get some live setups out of that. And that's been a really big hit, and we found some really big winners in that process. So I have a, a lot of fun doing it. Uh, the course, when I do the live course, it will be more than, than this price here. Uh, so that tends to just go up. But you will you can lock in access to that live course or any other live course I do on IPOs. Once you buy a course from me, it's yours for life, and you get to come to every other course related to that course for free. So every other IPO course I ever do, you could come in for free. Also, I give unlimited lifetime support. And that is obviously with, within reason. Be prepared to go in and rewatch the course I'm, and so you uh, have an idea what's really going on. But that will help you out. If there's an IPO five years from now and you have a question about it, you can shoot me an email. Uh, now, before how, let's, before how, let's look at uh, some reasons as to why. And it's the promise of the future. And we have to remember that there's a lot of excitement in IPOs. And that excitement might not materialize, but so what? If you get the fly part out of the IPO, that's fantastic. There's no pesky fundamentals. I was doing an article, oh, a month or so ago for Traders Magazine, uh, which is uh, it's prominent in Europe, but it's over here now, too. They have a circulation of about a half a million. Uh, anyway, before I digress too far, the, the main point was that I was making a case about how IPOs are inefficient and you should trade them and there's no fundamentals. And the more fundamentals you have, the more the water gets kind of muddied up and the more stocks are efficient and harder to trade. So I looked at one of the IPOs that were long and I noticed that they actually lost $2.93 and the IPO was trading around $16 a share at the time and they lost nearly three bucks a share. So that's a, on the prior year. So that's a significant loss. So there's no fundamentals to worry about, okay? And uh, fundamentals can kind of muck up a trade. Uh, not too much time to get into it tonight, but if you ever long a stock and earnings come out and and uh, it's it's a penny off or something ridiculous, or even if they beat earnings and the stock drops anyway because they wanted uh, more earnings or whatever, it, it really can mess up trades. But there's no earnings to begin with in a lot of these IPOs, so they just lose money and people don't get that excited about it. So it's a pretty cool thing. Because euphoria is a much bigger motivator than reality. The promise of the future versus the reality is much more exciting. And again, every now and then you'll get one and the reality does materialize. It just goes up and up and up and up and up. And that's a beautiful thing. And you'll absolutely print money in it. And the other thing to remember is every company, every company in the world at one point was an IPO. So there is a chance to get in on the ground floor. Now, the other beauty, beautiful thing is there's people with a vested interest, okay? And they're wanting that IPO to succeed. So, succeed. so like I said earlier, some people have their hands tied. They're not allowed to sell them. Uh, by the way, you can't short an IPO. Selected insiders can. That gets a little complicated. But trust me, you and I aren't those selected insiders that are, that are uh, that could have permission to sell short an IPO. So there's no short sales to worry about. A lot of people are wanting this IPO to succeed. So the point is, they're manipulated, okay? I guess I shouldn't say that, but uh, I don't guess anybody will come after me for saying that. But the, the bottom line is they are because there's a lot of people wanting to wanting the stock to go higher, okay? Uh, they trade purely on emotions. Again, there's not a whole lot of fundamentals to get in your way. There's that euphoria. There's some excitement. So they could be a chart reader's dream. They either go up or they go down at least most of the time. And you could avoid a lot of stinker trades, stinking trades by just not trading the ones that go down. And again, sit on your hands for a week. Efficiency is something I just talked briefly touched on, touched upon. Um, I have an article, you can get it off my website, I have free reports on, on efficiency. I would strongly urge 
that you uh, read that. But IPOs can be incredibly inefficient. They can go up 200% or 300%. So everything isn't priced dead. That euphoria comes into the market, that manipulation and everything else, and all of a sudden the, the um, IPO takes off. There's also a quiet period, and that tends to reduce noise. And then you're, you're also going to observe that – when that quiet period is lifted, and that can it could vary. There's no, not an exact quiet period, but I think around 180 days is probably most common. You'll notice when that quiet period is lifted, what does the company do? They come out with good good news, okay? They don't come out and say, oh, well, you know, uh, our company sucked to begin with. I don't know why we were stupid enough to take it public. No, there's, all, there's, there's this glowing report that the company puts out on how wonderful their company is and how much prospects – they have. Again, did I say manipulation? No, of course not. But I'd be willing to bet that that report was written a long, long time ago, long before that company ever came public. Now, they do have a story to sell. And this is where we get back to the promise of the future. They might cure some horror disease or they might solve the world's energy crisis. But sometimes it could be less lofty, but certainly important goals. They could be making good burritos or they can make comfortable exercise clothes for guys like Big Dave who eat too many burritos. I remember I kind of laughed at Lulamon, L-U-L-U, -L -U, I think is a symbol on that one because it was an IPO and I'm like, yeah, it's just, they make yoga clothes. How stupid is that? How much money can you make selling yoga clothes? And I made the mistake of confusing the issue with facts that I, I showed it on my trading service as as a Landry uh, in my Landry list, which is a call list of my favorite stocks. But I made fun of it and I didn't put it on as official recommendation and I didn't personally trade it. And then I watched it go up about 50 percent over the next few days. So that was an important lesson for me. Don't uh, confuse the issue. With facts. So one thing that I, I do say a lot of in the course is when you are looking at the IPO, not that it has to have a story because some kind of more generic type of companies can rally nicely as IPOs. But one thing I, I like to ask myself, what's the story, fad or glory? Is it some sort of fad that could be happening or is there some sort of glory, uh, maybe curing some heart disease again, or maybe it's a some kind of gee whiz technology that's going to solve an energy crisis or something along those lines that can get some euphoria into the market. But again, it doesn't always have to be uh, something that's uh, like grandiose, like again, curing diseases and energy problems, but uh, it could be something like yoga clothes. Okay. Now, again, uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse on this, but I can't emphasize this enough. It's amazing. No matter how many times I say something, especially like this, okay, the market's the final arbiter. Uh, tomorrow or the next day, whenever the next big IPO comes out, somebody's going to email me and say, Dave, what should I do? It's like nothing. Give it a week at least, at the least, and then make some decisions. So, again, the market is the final arbiter. Uh, understanding the mechanics helps. You really can't trade off of what's going on with the mechanics behind the scenes and before public offering. But it does help to get a feel for what might be going on. Like I just sort of hinted at, like the manipulation might come in after the quiet period to push it higher. You also have some people, as we'll see in just one second, that might be looking to get off the hook. So there is a little hidden supply in IPOs. But for the most part, as long as they're going up, everyone's happy and they tend to self-perpetuate higher and higher until eventually you do get some sort of correction in there, but eventually it can be a long time. So, again, don't confuse the issue with facts. If, if it's going up, it's going up, and you need to consider it as a possible trade. Now, again, it does help to know a little bit about what's going on before public offering, but all of this is academic at best. As soon as you cross into the trading world, as soon as it comes public, then this becomes reality, okay? So give them at least one week before you even think about trading them. And your life is going to become a lot better when it comes to trading IPOs. And if all you walked away with tonight is that one little thing to just give them one week, I think it just paid for your webinar, okay? Now, let's think about a little bit about the mentality of the insiders. So you have company insiders who are looking to get whole, okay? Uh, people put their blood, sweat, and tears into a company. They might have put their money into a company. 
and they might be mortgaged to the hilt or leveraged to the hilt, I should say, and they're looking to get hold. So that's you, you do have this pent up supply in here uh, possible in here. That's could explain the deep retraces. Again, this helps to wrap your head around everything, but you can't necessarily trade off of this. I've, I've seen people try to quantify these things, and it's just a really big mistake. The market is the final arbiter. If they're going up, you need to consider buying them on setups, of course. If they're going down, you need to just get out of the way, okay? And if you bought one and it's going up for a while and you took profits and it begins going down, let that trailing stop take you out of that position. So also you could have these fortunate insiders. Like I said, I I, I know a friend who, uh, who sold a brokerage firm for a lot of money and he's well-connected. He gets any IPO in the world, but he has to take a lot of garbage and – that debt, he told me flat out, it's probably not even worth the trouble. But I think his ego lets him or uh, makes him kind of feel like, oh, well, I've got this, uh, you know, this uh, hot IPO before it came public. Uh, and these people again are encouraged not to flip. So there's some people that are their hands are tied either either by the brokerage through threats like, well, we're not going to give you any more IPOs if you flip it out. So there's a lot of things that's going on with the insiders. And then there's a lockup period, and that lockup period might explain the deeper deep corrections that we see. Now those deep retract corrections, I don't trade them flat out, but there's definitely something there. And that's a pattern I, I do show the course called the first deep retrace, but it's a it's it's kind of far out uh, away from my methodology. And it's something that I might actually start trading. But for me to incorporate new things into my methodology, I've got to feel really, really good about them. And I'm feeling better and better about them, even though it's uh, it kind of is a little bit outside of my momentum-based methodology is to trade these after what I call the first deep correction, okay, or first deep retrace. I call them FDR patterns. Uh, there's, some un there's some assumptions that the underwriters will support the issue. Uh, one of the things I talked about in the course, though, is sometimes they price them too high and then they die, okay? That's that's really a, a – it's, it's somebody kind of goose when, when this happens. And that's why a lot of times you'll see in the first week again – they set the open grades and then they they drop. It's, it's somebody got greedy on going in, or something happened. They didn't do it right. They priced it too high, and then they die. But again, all you have to do don't try to buy it here, and then get screwed. Okay, wait to see if it can at least trade one week, or, or I should say break out after one week of trading before you even consider it. And again, you're gonna avoid a lot of stinker trades by doing that. So again, insiders have a vested interest. I know, big duh, on that. Now, before a company comes public, again, you got a lot of people who are on the hooks, those lucky uh, before uh, public offering buyers, employees with sweat equity, management, and then venture capitalists or the so-called VC. VC are a, um, I don't want to call them fickle, but they want to get off as soon as possible. So if this thing begins to tank a little bit, they're going to dump uh, on that stock to try to get out as quickly as as possible so you do have a little bit of what i call um overhead supply but for the most part there's no bad memories as long as that ipo is headed higher everyone is happy and not everyone's going to rush for the door at the same time and then some of that supply will work through the system if it keeps going higher and higher somebody looks to get whole and if their selling is not too much their uh, supply is not too much the market absorbs it then it goes higher and higher and it could end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, I just did an article for traders. It uh, checked back with me in about a month. Another, I just did another article for them. And it also did a, a webinar. You don't have to wait a month. You can go back and look. It was a couple of weeks ago. I did a webinar, at the Week in Charts webinar. It's on YouTube where I talked about how trading more volatile stocks is actually less risky than trading more I'm sorry, trading more volatile stocks is actually less risky than trading less volatile stocks, okay? If you adjust your share size accordingly, the chances of capturing a bigger move are much better in something that's more volatile than it is in something that's less volatile. And kind of in a nutshell, if you are to trade something that's less volatile, you're going to have to put more shares on. And something bad could always happen, like the CEO who decides he wants to sexually harass his secretary. And, and trust me, it happens. And I covered that in the article. So check back in a while, uh, in, a, in a week or two on that, or I should say a month, because um, it just went to the editor today. So the question is, is it uh, is the reward, does the reward outweigh the risk? Well, the 
Chinese symbol, and allegedly there's some arguments on this, but from the people I talked to, they said for the most part, this is a symbol for opportunity, and it's also the symbol for risk. So risk, opportunity comes with risk, and risk comes with opportunity. So you just kind of have to accept that. And don't get caught up in the price moves. Like I, I used an example in the article where I had an 18% stop on an IPO. Now, before you gasp, that's what it called for. And it went up like 100% or more, but it did have, at one point, measured high to low. Even though, even though it looked like it just was a beautiful trade, the stock just went straight up, it did have a little correction right after we got in. And that was almost, well, it actually was 18% from high to low, but luckily we didn't get stopped out. So you will have to use a little bit looser stops uh, within reason, and but you just adjust your share size accordingly, meaning that you're trading fewer shares. And that's something that's hard for some people to wrap their head around is that, oh, I can't risk that much. Well, if you put your stop within that volatility, meaning that you're using a tighter stop, you're more likely to get stopped out. I don't want to digress too far, but the point I made in the article is that a lot of people who are trying to avoid risk may actually be creating it with tight stops. And I fixed a lot of people and I didn't get any money for fixing them other than I feel uh, my reward is that I felt good about doing it is that I've had a lot of people call me up and they're, Dave, I'm just getting stopped out constantly and I can't catch a trend to save my life. It's like, well, first of all, make sure your stock selection is good. And that's, that's another conversation. But secondly, losing your stuff, losing your stops up. If you're, if you think your stock picking is good, loosen your stops up and adjust your share size accordingly. And I fixed a lot of people just by doing that. So where am I going with all this? The point is that they're riskier if you're just looking at the price movements. But if you, here's a little experiment that I, a little exercise I was thinking about uh, kind of presenting to everyone is take a look at the charts and just put an index card over that scaling and look at the chart in and of itself and forget about the size of the price bars. And I, psychologically, a lot of people can't use an 18% stop if that's what it calls for. Now, I'm not saying every position you have to have a stop that wide, but if it calls for that, that's what you need to use, okay? So just insert your favorite motivational quote, a ship uh, in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Uh, who's the happier man? He who has braved the storm of life and lived, or he who has stayed ashore, on shore and merely existed. And so we're speculators we are risk takers we get paid by putting capital into harm's way but it's not a wild and crazy thing it's amazing that people just come out and say that oh trading ipos is risky no it's not it's not any riskier than any other type of type of trading provided of course you adjust your share size accordingly and you're only risking a small percentage of your account on any given trade now, I don't want to get too far into money management, but as you can tell, money management is something I'm passionate about because without money management, you're never going to be successful as a trader. So the best way to trade is if you're just getting started with IPOs, would be first pullbacks. OK, now there are some exceptions again to my core methodology. There's some pioneer patterns, the early breakout type of patterns. Uh, there's some deep retracement patterns. There's some breakout ish patterns that I still think are worthwhile. Breakouts in general don't work as a general statement because everybody has a computer at a desk nowadays and they see a breakout, they get excited, they chase it, but the, the smart money, the mar market makers or whoever, they just smash it back down. In fact, you could argue that they kind of break it out to begin with. Well, with IPOs, they're not – you don't have that uh, massive following there, okay, so you're able to go in, and those breakouts can be wonderful things. So it's, uh, I'm trading more and more breakouts and IPOs now. Uh, what I call flagpole pullbacks is kind of an interesting thing. Usually I like a, a, a pattern to set up over a, a quite a few days and maybe weeks and even months on some of my patterns. But this is something that can happen over a very short period of time. So there are some exceptions to the core methodology, and there are some pioneer patterns. And again, like I said earlier, uh, longer term deep retracements can be quite uh, interesting too. Uh, there's some toddler patterns I've been uh, noodling with lately. Uh, baby come back is what I call one of them. And you're just looking for emerging trend patterns such as my bow tie or first thrust type of patterns. And these IPOs will come public. Their timing is wrong or whatever the case may be. And they'll just go down and kind of meander for a long, long time. And like the Phoenix, 
they'll end up rising from the ashes. So even though they're not a brand new IPO with all the excitement, the company gets its act together, or again, maybe their timing was just wrong to begin with. And then trading some of these core methodology patterns, such as the bow tie or the first thrust, can be quite lucrative, okay? Um, again, before we get into uh, covering first pullbacks again, for those of you who have to take off, uh, DaveLander.com and then the word trade IPOs. And again, the uh, promo code is, let me see if I can find my cursor. Oh, here it is. Is uh, IPO 200 and it's all lowercase. And that'll take 200 off the, um, the price. And again, you'll have access to the next webinar. I want to do it uh, maybe late this summer. It hasn't been officially scheduled yet, but uh, tentatively late this summer. We're going to do the, um, the next um we're going to redo the course live, and you'll have the, the old recordings, the new recordings, and access to any other course that I do on IPOs. So if all you did was trade first pullback at IPOs, I think you do really well. And this is actually a real example. And you can see that this market began to accelerate higher, this IPO, I should say, and then begin to pull back. So you had a couple of things working for it. It should be very obvious when you first get started trading uh, these IPOs. Uh, Trill, this is what we actually uh, was in the trading service a while back. And there was a pioneer pattern back here, which we're not going to get into deeply tonight. But notice that it did trend nicely higher. Also notice that the market or this particular stock uh, trended higher day after day after day. In other words, it persisted higher. And you could draw a trend line through most of the bars. Mathematically, that's known as linear regression. You know me. I like to keep it simple. I just like to draw a trend line through the bars. And then you look to trade that first pullback in the IPO. So that could be a wonderful pattern to trade. Let me show you another example here. This one's pretty obvious also. You can see that it was working its way higher. There's some early trend patterns that were working uh, back here, or, or merging trend patterns, I should say. But notice that it began to accelerate higher. And then you look to trade, again, that first little pullback when and if the trend begins to resume. So the question is, is trading IPOs hard? And what's kind of interesting is one of the simplest patterns that I discovered, an early breakout pattern, it was so simple, I was almost embarrassed to show people, but I began trading it, and it began working time after time again, and, and I almost felt like I was holding back. So I was like, you know what? It's working. This is one of these early trend patterns after that first week of trading that's worthwhile. So the answer is, is trading IPS hard? No. You could do it. <laughs> And if you go here, howtotradeipos.com, it'll bring you back to the um, to the IPO page on uh, my website. So, again, that pattern is so simple. I, I'd be willing to bet I could teach a 10-year-old to trade. And you know what? That 10-year-old could probably do a lot better than a lot of us because they he or she would look at the pattern and say, well, there it is. Let's trade it. And he wouldn't he wouldn't outthink it too much. Well, maybe, wait a minute. This company makes yoga clothes or, you know, there's reasons why this company shouldn't go up. But. Yeah, they wouldn't overthink it too much. They would just trade the pattern. Okay, good questions. Keep the questions coming. I'm getting ready to get to them in one second. Uh, how do you how do you fish for the sardines? How do you find the IPOs? I use a software, a trick, which if you have telecharts, I'll be happy to explain to you. Uh, all I'm doing is sorting by I, – I, I put an indicator up. Like if I want to see the last 10 days, it's like close minus 10. And anything that gets rejected came public in the last 10 days. So – if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. I'll send you my formulas if you want them. But what I'll do is I'm going to make I'll make a list for you. And then along with the recording of this webinar, uh, like I did last time, and that's a lot of the examples we just used came from last time. So the uh, last webinar I did on IPOs back in August, um, April. So but I'll send you the list uh, for uh, as a thank you for attending tonight of potential IPOs that you should watch. And I'm going to call out, I'm going to clean and finish cleaning it up uh, before I send it out. I'm going to call out some of these um, stocks that are very, very thin. I'm going to call out some stocks that could probably never set up oh, at least over the next uh, six months or so. And then I'm going to also going to call out those that are higher in volume that have been established for quite a while, such as the toddlers, but those will get picked up by, um, by other scans, which, by the way, I'll give you if you have a telechart. So, again, uh, just make sure that before you even attempt to trade an IPO that's been trading for at least one week, okay? So the takeoff is there's a bull market in IPOs, but the, there's a demarcation also, okay? So it's starting to look more and more like this and like this. There's still quite a few that are going up. 
they're still worth trading, okay? And then there's still new issues coming to the market. In fact, if this market starts getting iffy, we could see a big influx of IPOs, and it could be a wonderful opportunity to rush out and trade these things, okay, as they're trying to rush out and get them public before the market tanks. The other good thing is if the market does tank, nobody in their right mind is going to bring a company public, okay, because you want to bring a company public in good condition. So they are self-regulating, and you just sit on your hands a little bit and wait until you get some good opportunities. There's nothing wrong with waiting. In fact, if you the probably the when you the becoming a successful trader is probably when you learn how to become patient. Okay. Most successful traders are very patient. So um but you, tonight's takeaway again is there's a bull market in IPOs. Uh, don't trade them before they come public. Don't try to get them before they come public. Don't try to get them as they come public. Don't try to buy that opening uh, range on them. That's just purely gambling as far as I'm concerned. Uh, do buy them when they're going up and avoid them if they go down. And sometimes it's that simple. And that's the beauty lately is the demarcation has just been absolutely wonderful. Some of these companies go public or come public and then within a week they begin to tank. Okay. And no capital was put into harm's way. And that's a beautiful thing. Uh, there are some pioneer patterns like I talked about, but that's okay. If you miss those or if you decide that they're too risky for you or you would rather see the company establish itself, you almost always get a second chance. So that first pullbacks we talked about earlier, that could be a wonderful pattern to trade it again. The takeaway is they either go up or go down usually, okay, and they trade that first pullback. If that's all you took away tonight, then I think you, you're going to do just fine, uh, at least getting started with them. There's a lot more details, obviously. I spent uh, about eight hours total in the course, but – I'm throwing a lot at you tonight, a lot of the simple concepts. And if you grasp these concepts, then the rest is just details, okay? Now, again, if you use a core methodology, meaning pullbacks and bow ties and patterns like that, these toddlers can still make some really good trades, okay? Um, if you like what you heard tonight, you're going to love the IPO course. I have I think I've had one – I don't think I've ever had an IPO course return. I, I might be wrong on that, but let me think about that. Uh, there's a 100% money back guarantee, but it, most people who watch my webinars and understand what I'm trying to say and realize that it's not hocus pocus and it's reality and you're going to have some losses. I probably talk about losses too much. I probably talk about money management too much, but that's the reality of trading. I can come up here and tell you you're going to make all this money and never have a loss and probably sell a lot more courses, okay? But the reality is there will be some losses. You will have some money management. So, I like to see what I'm doing is very realistic. It's what I do in my own trading, and it's repeatable, okay? I'm not coming out and, and telling you some kind of counting system or something, and then when you try to count the bars or whatever, I'm always correcting you. No, you got it wrong. You had the wrong count. And then on the good trades, I'll show you, oh, look, this is the right count. There's nothing like that, okay? So the point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one, is that um, if you like what you're hearing tonight, you're going to like uh, – you're going to love the course. And if you don't like what you're hearing, then you're not going to like the course, okay? Um, so tomorrow, th this uh, this offer is going to go until Monday. But uh, check your email tomorrow. I'll give you a list of IPOs, and then I'll give you some follow-up information on tonight's um, uh, webinar. Uh, what else? Well, there's a lot of other things. I don't want to bore you and read this all to you, but um, I do think as a private trader, you have advantage over the big boys when it comes to trading, and trading is a key word. IPOs, uh, some more information on toddlers, a lot more information on market efficiency, very important concept, uh, more on bigger picture patterns. I did setup, setup, setups. There's about eight setups total, I think, that I uh, have in the course. And there's a lot of pioneer type of setups to get you in very early. And the great thing about those is your stop is very well defined on those patterns. Whereas once you get into the secondary, uh, setups then your stop it's a little bit more questionable as to where those stops can go so the the early patterns the pioneer patterns are just fantastic um and again you know just a little bit more elaboration on everything we talked about tonight more information about the who's behind the scenes uh how the core methodology works with the ipos and how you can massage it a little bit and maybe bend the rules a little bit and trade these wonderful ipos that are headed higher and then when I do a course, I also do follow-up uh, webinars. And again, we're going to have a follow-up course this summer. 
But even within this uh, webinar, the last webinar, the recorded uh, course, I should say, not the webinar, the course, we had some follow-up sessions. So you get to see what works and what doesn't in real time. Anybody can come out and tell you things in theory, but it's a lot harder to come out and do it in practice. And that's what I do in my trading service every day. I come out and say, here's the stocks, here's the setups, let's go after them, let's see what happens. Here's a money management plan, here's a position management plan. And we do it, okay, in real time. So in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. So I like to show practice in addition to what I'm doing in theory when it comes to these courses. So to get money and position management, you know, there it is again. I, I probably talk too much about that, but that's a reality. you got to have a money and position management plan in place. Uh, I do, I'm not a mechanical trader, but there are some things that you can do mechanically that work quite well with uh, IPOs and I'm going to show you that in the course more on secondary patterns and then again lifetime access to uh, to me and any other courses uh, as far as it relates to the IPOs and then again I said I wouldn't read it all but I am six pitfalls to avoid your own personal psychology it's nearly impossible for me to talk about trading and you, you saw it maybe a little bit uh, slip out a little bit tonight but it's nearly impossible possible for me to talk about trading without talking about trading psychology. So that always works its way into the course. Uh, one of the problems with IPOs is that they are lower in volume and there's some hidden volume out there which can make trading these lower volatility, uh, I'm sorry, lower volume IPOs worthwhile. And I'll explore that, or I did explore that in the course. Uh, sometimes there's some sectors you actually wanna avoid when it comes to trading IPOs. And I get into that in a lot more detail so again here's the um, there's the URL for the uh, course and let's go ahead and take some uh, questions okay somebody's watching soccer huh all right let's take a look at uh, questions here oh keep coming a lot of good questions okay you're welcome Chris do you have a list of brokers that handle IPOs uh, any major broker handles IPOs um, I don't recommend, again, not to beat the dead horse, but I don't recommend that you get get into them uh, before public offerings. But if you're uh, if you're with a major brokerage, if you're with a an older an old school brokerage that handles IPOs and you have a lot of money with them, there's a chance for you to get the um, the IPO before they come public. Um, but I would suggest that you don't. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the the old adage if um, if you're able to get it, you're not going to want it, okay? So the good stuff you're not going to get, and you're going to end up with a lot of, um, how do I put it mildly, a lot of uh, crap, <laughs> okay? So, yeah, any broker, because, again, we're trading after uh, they come public, okay? How much does the SEC look at the background of IPO founders? I have no idea. And then Charles goes on to talk about Zuckerberg. Yeah, I don't care. I mean, does it matter? Okay. Um, you know, bottom line is you got to ask yourself, well, I guess like Einstein is the universe friendly, but when you get through with all those questions, ask yourself, is the stock or IPO going up or is it going down? Don't worry about anything back here. Okay. That's all academic. Enjoy the webinar. So have to run. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate you coming. How soon do options start trading once a company makes an IPO? It all depends. Um, that's that's one of those questions that I can't give you a definitive answer on. Uh, with um, I have TC Telechart is what I use for my charting, uh, my main charting, at least in my analysis. I also use Metastock, too. But with Telechart, when I'm flipping through the charts, uh, I'll notice that it'll have optionable. I've got the optionable feel on top of my screen, and that'll pop up. Uh, I would imagine with um, bigger, huge cap stocks like uh, Facebook and Twitter and things like that, when they come public, uh, they, they the options trade sooner. I'm not a big fan of trading options because you have to get price and time right. And trust me, it's hard enough just getting direction and time right with the market. And then you got to get, um, I'm sorry, direction right. Then you got to get time right on top of that. So I would encourage you not to trade options, okay? They would transpired with Baba to climb. We can take a look at that. You know, Baba was one that there was a lot of uh, euphoria on right away. 
Okay, does volume play, while we wait for the charts to come up, let me answer another question. Uh, does volume play any role in your analysis? No, zero, absolutely zero. All I want to know is if the stock is has enough volume to make trading it worthwhile. And again, that's one thing we got into the course is uh, what is there if there's some um, hidden volume, which is kind of um, it's kind of hard to uh, to deduce. But if you're seeing some good volume bars, uh, you could figure out that there's there might be some hidden volume in there, even though uh, especially if you have a lot of volume in early trading. Okay, so you want to look at Baba? We'll take a look at that one. Hold on one second. I got that window back here. Okay. Now, notice what Baba did, which is kind of fascinating. Baba came public really high in its first day of trading. What happened? It died out. Okay. So sometimes they die and then they fly again. Okay. But this wasn't one that I was very excited about because it came public at such a high price. And this looks like a huge move from here to here, but that's only like 15 points. So that's that's not really that great of a deal. And you can see that now this uh, this one has failed miserably. So anything that's really super, super hyped, you probably don't want to be trading or just wait until you have some sort of setup. Like Twitter came public and just kind of died out, but then it made some nice secondary patterns and it took off again. And we're getting this fact. Let's pull up Twitter. Let me show you something here with Twitter. If memory serves, it um, it died out. Yeah, see, notice how it first died out. And this, let me explain the bars a little bit. But notice that if you waited until it just took out its first week of trading, I mean, this is the biggest hyped, uh, one of the second biggest hyped uh, IPOs in history, then it finally took off, okay? So just by staying out of that first week of trading, you can stay out of a lot of trouble. With such limited data, only a week to use different time frames to trade, uh, first pullback sooner or better. No, I think what uh, Dave is getting at, he's asking, like, uh, what about intraday charts? What about hourly charts? Because you have a limited amount of data. And I think patterns are fractal. Uh, I know a lot of people who trade my methodology intraday and use intraday bow ties and things like that. It's not something I'm really into. I just prefer the daily charts. And I think even with the limited data, I mean, I can get signals on day six with IPOs. So for me, that's um, that's plenty early enough. And again, as I preached early and early, I mean earlier and over and over again, um, let them trade for at least a week before you even think about uh, getting into the trade. And I think five days is not too long to wait. So don't rush out and trade intraday pullbacks on these. Okay, good question though. Yeah, yeah, E S E T S Y. This is the this is the poster child. I showed this one actually earlier. Uh, on my charts. This is a poster child. Okay. The question is, was ETSY a good IPO? <laughs> I, I guess you're joking, Steven, but uh, this is the poster child for why we did not try to buy IPOs too early. We let them trade for at least a week. And this is one I showed earlier and it was up in the twenties. Uh, I, I didn't update my chart for this presentation, but I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Look at this uh, dog, okay? Now, this might bottom out eventually, and it might form a pattern. They might get their act together, whatever, and it might be worth trading at some point. But right now, okay, just draw a big arrow on your charts, and you can see that. Just avoid this one like the plague, okay? So, yeah, this was uh, – somebody messed up here. And if done properly, like I said earlier, there's a little manipulation that seems to occur in these things. And they push them higher, and you get on, and you you get on the ride with the VC and all those insiders. Again, let's not try to figure out who they are and what they are. Like somebody said, uh, who somebody's mom is, or did they go to Harvard or whatever? Don't worry about all that. All you have to worry about is the price. What is this stinker doing? It's going down. Okay, that's an IPO you want to avoid, like the plague. Okay. Any tells from poker first week? No, with the volume? No, not really, because uh, you don't know what that – it's impossible to tell where volume is coming from or what the volume is actually doing. I don't use volume in any of my trading, again, other than to see if markets are uh, liquid enough to trade. Some people may argue with that, but ultimately, 
you have to make a decision whether or not you want to buy at price. You're not buying because a stock has a certain volume. You're not agreeing, I should say, on volume with someone else. You're agreeing on price. So just use price. Don't confuse the issue uh, with facts by trying to interject, interject volume. I can take either side of the coin when it comes to volume. If you have stock goes up on light volume, some people say, oh, that's bearish. Or, but the price is going up. That means that the price is being bid up and nobody wants to sell it. So that's actually bullish. So you see how it gets uh, tricky really quick. That's a Dick Orms uh, argument uh, with his what he calls it ease of movement. Now, he's spent a considerable amount of his life uh, working with volume. So Dick Orm uses volume. I personally I do not. I'd rather not use it. But if I had to, I, I think I agree with Dick. If, you, if I had to use volume in my analysis, I would do something like that. You're welcome, Peter. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> Can you give us an x-ray view of how market makers will try and trick the public into IPO early trading? Any observations based on the flow of patterns to Benito based on your vast experience common fake out patterns? Uh, no different than anything else. I mean, just like, um, which one is it? I'm, I'm trying to think of. It might be R-E-L-Y or one of those ones we talked about in one of these presentations. Sometimes you will get something like a like a, a base in early trading, okay? And then you get a breakdown from that base, and then you, you play a breakdown above it. It's like they shake in the tree a little bit. But again, if you're just playing price, the beauty of an IPO is with limited history and everything, a lot of times it is almost as simple as that. Uh, what I call buy at B, A, B, C, okay? Obviously, there's a little bit more to it than that, but even with the manipulation that occurs, uh, these things can happen. And it's not, and it's not that as much manipulation like you would see in a normal stock and a normal daily trading. For instance, like you're trading pullbacks, you used to be able to put your stock, uh, I'm sorry, your, your entry right above the high, and now we're using a little bit more wiggle room because it became pretty obvious that the market makers were trying to trick in those people by triggering their um, their pullbacks. And that's why there's a, I don't want to digress too far, but that's why there's a repeatability to my methodology, especially the core methodology, or I should say that's what I'm referring to, the core methodology, because I'm using liberal entries and liberal stops, and that manipulation happens within the entry and the stop most of the time and i'm able to avoid that manipulation but i'm talking when i talk about manipulation with ipos i'm talking about a general consensus to push them consensus to push them higher and then you just get along for the ride keep it simple understood okay very good fantastic thanks dave awesome presentation thank you charles we have a different charles this time last time the charles was not a big fan <laughs> you both tired pattern is hall of fame pattern dave awesome description Oh, thank you so much, Charles. Yeah, I screwed up, though. I should have uh, should have named it after myself, like my friend uh, John Bollinger named his patterns, you know. Um, and I'm not name dropping. I just happen to know John. Uh, but he was brilliant at naming his uh, patterns after himself. I call that a bow tie. And um, I've even seen him on, on, on I'm not going to say the network, but let's just say the biggest network out there when it comes to business. I see him talk about bow ties, and I'm thinking, geez, who invented that, you know. But, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Submitted on to webinar today and when looking uh, for you again after reading Guide to Conquering Trading Markets. Wow, that's a that's a uh, throwback to history, huh? And finding tradehard.com is no more. Look forward to reading you following up again. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, my my death has been, uh, who was it, Big Jagger or someone once said his, uh, his death has been greatly exaggerated. It's like... Um, after I left uh, trading markets, and it was trade hard before that, back in, uh, oh, geez, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, people like, hey, Dave disappeared. But no, I, I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, let me just thank everyone one more time. I appreciate you coming uh, tonight. Um, check out the course. It's pretty good. 100% pretty good. It's better than pretty good. I, I've had uh, a lot of people been very happy with it. Um, and I appreciate uh, those of you who have purchased it, but 100% uh, money back guarantee, so nothing to worry about. And I'm I'm really good about uh, getting that right back to you, so don't worry about that. Okay. All right, uh, going once. Any more questions? Going twice. You're welcome. Charles says thanks for helping others. You're welcome. Mark Twain said that. Oh yeah, it was Mark Twain said my death has been greatly exaggerated. Yeah, I think uh, Mick Jagger said it a little bit later in life, but I hear you. <laughs> Good night, Patty.
All right. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you coming. Any follow-up questions, Dave at DaveLander.com. I personally answer all my emails. Sometimes it takes me a day or two to get back to you. Uh, but if you're on the course or if you have the course or if you're on the service, obviously I'll give you guys precedent first. But I will answer all emails, and I guess I need to put the caveat in there eventually. But feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions. Everyone have a fantastic night, and uh, keep an eye out for the report tomorrow. I'll put together the IPOs and some follow-up information. Thank you so much. Tuck says I'm glad I came. Thank you, Tuck. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, John.